I am going to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Judge Levinsky Smith of the Eighth Circuit. Judge Smith is a native Arkansan. Uh, he graduated from the University of Arkansas with both his BA and JD. He started off his legal career representing indigent defendants at the Ozark Legal Services. And he quickly moved into public service at the Arkansas Pub Public Service Commission. In 1999, Governor Mike Huckabee appointed him to the Arkansas Supreme Court. And in 2001, President George W. Bush appointed him to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And we're really lucky to have Judge Smith here today because next week he's taking over the chief judge spot for the Eighth Circuit. So we're really glad that he uh, took the time to be with us today. Judge Smith. Thank you, Shiva. And uh, many thanks to all of you here uh, at the Federalist Society chapter here at Columbia for the invitation to appear and participate on a panel and a debate on a subject as vital as the First Amendment. Service in the legal profession affords many special privilege, uh, privileges to its members. These include the ability to wield the levers of the machinery of justice, to vindicate the rights of individuals and groups, to fully participate in our democracy, so that everyone is able to equally enjoy its privileges and bear its burdens. Having witnessed racial segregation firsthand in my youth, I appreciate the need to eliminate invalid distinctions among people in the enjoyment of liberty. I was 12 years old when the schools in my town first integrated fully. I was a little bit older when the doctor's office stopped having two waiting rooms. The ABA's uh, amended rule, which is the subject of this debate, uh, Rule 8.4G, has a laudatory purpose, banning professional conduct that constitutes harassment or discrimination. But there is a peril in the pursuit of that purpose. Silencing a viewpoint by redefinition can be as pernicious as an explicit ban. The voice of the minority, whether social or ideological, deserves to be heard, even if unpopular, among the public or disfavored by those in power. The First Amendment is essential to the freedom of these United States. Lawyers and judges play a very vital role in preserving the bedrock principles of the First Amendment. Consequently, when laws and rules are created that may limit the ability of the members of the legal profession to speak freely in informal, informal court proceedings or in informal social settings, such uh, enactments merit close scrutiny. This discussion that we're going to have, and it's styled as a debate, but I think you'll find it probably more in the nature of a uh, an earnest discussion of individuals with varying du viewpoints. Uh, there's, I certainly don't anticipate the uh, uh, castigation of the opponent in, uh, in some ad hominem style uh, uh, as we proceed. We're very fortunate to have some very distinguished uh, participants as the uh, uh, proponents and of their views. Our speakers are first Professor Eugene Volokh, and then we'll have uh, Attorney Robert N. Weiner. Professor Volokh teaches First Amendment law at UCLA School of Law, where he was president of the Federalist student chapter in 1992. Indeed, he was a member of the society two years before he even went to law school, to give you some idea of his interest. Mr. Weiner is a partner with the Washington, D.C. law firm of Arnold and Porter K. Scholler. After graduating from Yale Law School, he clerked for Judge Henry Friendly and Justice Thurgood Marshall. He is an accomplished litigator and legal strategist, having worked as a government attorney in diverse roles such as Associate Deputy Attorney General from 2010 to 2012, and previously, uh, or prior to that, as senior counsel in the White House Counsel's Office from 1997 to 1998. He has worked extensively in private practice as well uh, as in a, in, a, in a broad range of legal subject areas at the trial and appellate levels. 
Currently, he is chair-elect of the Civil Rights and Social Justice section of the American Bar Association. Please join me in welcoming them both for participation in this debate. First, we'll hear from Professor Volley. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. A very great pleasure to be here. Always a great pleasure uh, to be at a Federalist Society event, but especially uh, talking about this subject. And the title of my talk, I like to keep them descriptive, is the ABA proposes a nationwide lawyer speech code. That's exactly what it is doing. Uh, it is a speech code that is not limited to the courtrooms, where, of course, in courtrooms, we know that speech is restricted, and rightly so, in many ways, rules of evidence and everything else. But it deliberately, consciously, indubitably applies to a wide range of other uh, speech by lawyers. Uh, this, it seems to me, is a First Amendment violation. It's also a bad idea. I'll talk very briefly at the end, as we'd agreed, about a couple of other not quite First Amendment problems with it. But the chief a concern that I have is that this basically violates the First Amendment and deliberately tries to suppress certain viewpoints that uh, the bar may disapprove of. Uh, what does the rule say? So it begins by saying it is professional misconduct to engage in conduct. It excludes legitimate advice or advocacy, so I'm not going to talk about things that people say in the context of argument in court, let's say. That the lawyer knows or reasonably should know is, among other things, harassment based on race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, in conduct related to the practice of law. Now, what is conduct related to the practice of law? And what is harassment? Well, the comment helpfully tells us discrimination and harassment includes harmful verbal conduct that manifests bias or prejudice towards others. Non-lawyers, instead of the phrase verbal conduct, tend to use the word speech because that's exactly what this is about. It is about speech that expresses certain viewpoints that, uh, the, according to whatever bar entity is going to be investigating this, uh, are biased, prejudiced, or derogatory. Note, it is, does not limit itself, say, to fighting words, to say personal insults. Uh, it uh, doesn't uh, talk about uh, manifesting bias or prejudice towards a particular person, towards others. A, uh, a, a, so speech that is seen as derogatory uh, or biased towards a group uh, is by its very terms prohibited. Now what's conduct related to the practice of law? Again, the comment is very helpful to us. Conduct related to the practice of law includes not just interacting, say, in court. Uh, uh, it also includes conduct within the management of a law firm, so it applies to speech among lawyers including ones who may not be covered by employment discrimination law, for example, because the law firm is too small to be covered by Title VII. And it expressly includes bar association, business or social activities in connection with the practice of law. I'm pretty sure what I'm doing here is a, an activity in connection with the practice of law. Quite certainly when I speak to Federalist Society lawyers chapters, that is a bar association, business or social activity in connection with the practice of law. If California adopts this rule, then somebody could file a complaint against me because things that I've said in uh, a debate on some subject uh, uh, might uh, be seen as, according to the complainant, as manifesting bias or prejudice. Uh, now, what is harassment? Well, unfortunately, there the definition is not so clear beyond what we see here, which is the expression of biased viewpoints. Uh, if the uh, uh, comments uh, suggest that one ought to look to the rules of harassment as developed in hostile environment law. There are subtly different rules in different areas, but basically it's speech that is severe or pervasive enough, except when that requirement is relaxed, as it sometimes is, to create an offensive environment based on these criteria for the complainant and for a reasonable person. So that doesn't really help us much. It certainly doesn't narrow it at all. So what we do, of course, being good lawyers, is we look to see how uh, courts and administrative agencies have interpreted uh, um, what constitutes harassment or discrimination. So for example, people wearing Confederate flag t-shirts uh, a couple of times a month to a workplace the EEOC has found to be harassment. So if someone puts on a debate about the Sons of Confederate Veterans case and somebody comes in, a lawyer comes in to participate on the panel and he proudly wears a Confederate flag necktie, let's say, 
uh, that could be seen as harassment on the grounds that Confederate flag t-shirts are offensive. I actually have very little patience for a Confederate flag myself. Uh, I think one needs to be attentive to symbolism, and it's a symbol of a very bad regime indeed, no matter what other qualities people want to ascribe to it. Seems to be, though, clearly protected by the First Amendment. Uh, EEOC seems to have taken a different view in that case, and exactly the same uh, could easily be applied by a state bar. Here's another example from a case that just came down a few weeks ago. A complainant emailed the supervisor the gov that government employees generally work shorter hours, but she was working too long, she said. She's working like a civilian. Here's what the supervisor responded. <laughs> wow, then I must be a damn fool, because I've been working like a Hebrew slave the last nine years and don't have enough time to take off. Now, it turns out that the complainant was Jewish. And the supervisor may well have known this. I find it very hard to see this as at all anti-Semitic. I'm Jewish myself. I'm not somebody who knows the Old Testament terribly well, but I'm pretty sure I know what Hebrew slaves refers to. It, doesn't, it isn't an attempt to be pejorative towards Jews. It's actually reflecting a story from the Old Testament about how the Jews were oppressed, and then eventually uh, the Pharaoh got his comeuppance. Nice story. Uh, uh, but, uh, but not so according to the complaint and not so as to the EEOC, which allowed a, a compensatory damages award and attorney fees award in favor of the complainant on the grounds that this single incident was harassment. Um, statement that a Trayvon Martin shooting wouldn't have led to the same controversy if a white man had been shot was found by a state administrative agency to be harassment. There's another case, uh, uh, this is from a federal district court case, a coworker had posted, this is in the 1980s, when there of course was e even more tension in some respects between the US and Iran than there is now, uh, posted two photographs in her own work cubicle. One was of the Ayatollah Khomeini, the other was a photograph of an American flag burning in Iran, and the court labeled that as discriminatory anti-Iranian conduct, didn't lead to liability only because employer promptly insisted it be taken down. So, unsurprising when people try to ban speech that constitutes harassment uh, and label it as derogatory speech and the like, yes, of course, it's a viewpoint-based restriction on speech that is found to be offensive based on certain viewpoints that uh, the authorities uh, uh, find improper. Here's another case from the EEOC. This is the Gadsden flag, the Don't Tread on Me flag. Somebody complained saying this was racist. Now, the EOC acknowledged that in the face it isn't, but it said, complaint that describes racial connotations as a symbol based on observation that it is sometimes displayed in racially tinged situations. It's true, there were a couple of incidents where some racist groups appropriated the symbol. In light of the ambiguity in the current meaning of the symbol, we find that the claim must be investigated to determine the specific context in which the, the symbol was displayed. And the case, the contrary decision by the agency was remanded back to the agency for further investigation. Now, I, I don't think the investigation is completed. Maybe they'll ultimately say, well, no, there wasn't enough evidence that complainant was reasonable in perceiving it as having racial connotations. But imagine you're a lawyer. What will it do to your speech if you know that, that certain statements, facially racially neutral statements, but one that somebody might ascribe racial connotations to, will lead to a bar investigation? My sense is your goal as a lawyer is not to be vindicated in the bar investigations. It's to avoid bar investigations. <laughs> and that is precisely the chilling effect that the law always has and foreseeably has, and perhaps even in this case intentionally has, to deter people from saying things that even might trigger this kind of investigation. Um, so what else might be harassment? Well, I don't have specific cases, but given the cases, given the definition, it seems pretty clear the following might be. How about a bar association debate about same-sex marriage, in which one of the debaters, who is a lawyer, who is invited by other lawyers, this is a, a function related to the practice of law, uh, uh, says, well, same-sex marriage is, should not be recognized because homosexuality is immoral. Understandably, some uh, people in the audience are offended based on sexual, their sexual orientation, feels this creates an offensive environment to them. That, that could very well be punishable under the rule. Or how about a debate about gender identity and anti-discrimination rules, a debate that's still very much in progress. Uh, uh, that too, one side of it may very well be found to be uh, creating a hostile environment and harassing through the expression of biased or prejudiced viewpoints. Or about a debate on illegal immigration? Again, on its face, it may be racially neutral, but the Gadsden flag on its face is racially neutral. Maybe people might ascribe racial connotations to one or another position. How about a debate on immigration from various Muslim countries? Or how the law should treat Scientologists? Um, uh, or how about discussions about the same topic at law firm parties or over conference dinners? By its very terms, it's quite 
seems quite clear that the 8.4G at least will potentially po cover it. Whether it will or will not, of course, depends on how these vague terms are interpreted by bar association uh, uh, decision makers, which I think is, is not a saving grace of the law. It just highlights how troublesome it is, or the proposed rule. Uh, Texas AG, I think, got it right in an early opinion, just had, came down a few weeks ago, uh, saying that the rule would likely infringe upon the free speech rights of members of the state bar because it would severely restrict attorneys' ability to engage in meaningful debate on a range of important social and political issues. Now, if somebody is interested in going after, for example, offensive speech in the context of, uh, uh, of uh, a courtroom hearing or even in the context of an interaction with a client or opposing, or, or opposing party or uh, uh, in a deposition where there may be room, in fact, to trying to prevent witnesses, for example, from being uh, unduly insulted in the course of, uh, of the proceedings, uh, perfectly possible to do that. In fact, many rules already do that by focusing on procedures related to the administration of justice or involved in the administration of justice. As, as we saw in the rule, the rule deliberately, explicitly, unambiguously goes way beyond that. Let me close with two other things. A second problem, which I think is not a First Amendment problem, but I think is still a serious one, is you know not all states ban sexual orientation discrimination uh, in employment, for example, or gender identity discrimination, uh, and virtually none ban socioeconomic status discrimination the way this rule would. I don't see why it is that the bar uh, or that state supreme courts should set up employment law for, uh, for one class of business, law firms, different from the employment law for other classes of businesses. If a state legislature has chosen not to ban sexual orientation discrimination, whether that's right or wrong, uh, or as so many not to ban um, socioeconomic status discrimination, uh, then in that case I don't see why it is that the state bar or state courts should. Now they, are, they do rightly exercise special power within the administration of justice. Again, what goes on inside the courtroom is rightly regulated by the bar and by the state Supreme Court. But what goes on, uh, even setting aside social functions, what goes on in the employment context, it seems a matter of employment law for the legislature. Let me close with the, one, the third problem, which is a separate problem, but I think helps illustrate how far this kind of ideology of uh, trying to stop or trying to ensure equality in preference to all other values, including freedom of speech, but others as well, uh, goes. One of the things that's prohibited, including in employment, including in contracting and various other things, is socioeconomic status discrimination. There, the rule is not helpful. It doesn't tell us what that means. But we do have one definition, in fact, the definition from the uh, federal sentencing context, the one area we have the crispest, clearest ban on discrimination based on the same phrase, socioeconomic status. It's an individual status in society as determined by criteria such as education, income, and employment. So if this rule is adopted, then a firm, for example, saying we're going to prefer law students from Columbia because we think that this is a high status educational institution. Uh, may very well be violating the rules. If, if a p lawyer decides I'm going to choose as a partner somebody who's already very successful because I think we may need to draw on his resources, or conversely, I'd, I'd rather partner up with someone who hasn't made his money yet because he's hungrier, uh, then in that case, that would be literally by its terms violation of the rule. This makes no sense in my view. You might say it's inadvertent, except this was pointed out to the bar by people, myself included, but others as well, uh, in, the no, in the notice and comment procedure, and the bar blithely went on despite that. So if this is bad drafting, it's very bad drafting. If it is intentional drafting, it's a very bad idea. So with that, I close, turn things over. <laughs> So I'm reminded of the story of the Texan who's driving his Cadillac with the big bullhorns in the front in Vermont, and he runs into a Vermont farmer, and they start talking. The Vermont farmer says, well, that's my farm. It goes from there over to there. Texan says, well, you know, I have a ranch in Texas, and if I start driving at the east end, uh, I won't even make the west end by the end of the day. And the farmer says, gee, I had a car like that once, too. <laughs> So like the Texans ranch, uh, 
this rule is not the big deal that it's made out to be. Uh, it's not unprecedented. It's not uh, a dramatic expansion, and it's really not all that new. Uh, its primary focus is conduct. Doesn't mean it doesn't uh, that it uh, doesn't read speech. It means that the primary focus is not speech. And the hypotheticals that Professor Volokh has uh, trotted out are remote and implausible. Uh, if they were to arise, there is a remedy. It's called an as-applied challenge. Uh, but the hypoth hypothetical situations are not sufficient in and of themselves to sustain a dar an argument about overbreadth um, and chill. Beyond that, uh, I think that um, I will show that trying to remit these issues to the employment law would be a very bad idea. So first point, it's not new. Let's see. Which way does this go? There we go. So 24 states and the District of Columbia have an anti-discrimination rule of some sort. Now the 13 states have it in their comments. Um, so it's not unprecedented, nor is it new that it applies um, beyond the representation of a client. That's true right now in at least 10 states. Uh, a number specifically apply to employment. Uh, it's not new that it regulates the business of practicing law. You can't sell your practice uh, without being subject to those rules. You can't um, uh, change the name. Your name of your firm is regulated. The, uh, the supervisory relationships are regulated, but for some reason discrimination uh, is, is, is problematic when you regulate that. Other obligations, uh, ethical obligations, extend beyond the courtroom. Um, it's, it's improper to engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. It doesn't matter where you do it. Um, it's also not new that this regulates speech. Rule 1.6, you can't uh, reveal confidential information. You can't say certain things to people who aren't your client. There's a rule on trial publicity. So we've regulated speech before. Moreover, the explicit focus of this rule is conduct. Um, it is part of the rules of professional conduct. It deals with misconduct. It relates to engaging in conduct. Um, those, uh, does it reach speech? Yes, it, re it reaches speech. Most of what, or at least a lot of what we do as, as lawyers involves speech, but speech is not the primary focus. Harmful verbal or physical contact, or conduct. Derogatory or demeaning, verbal or physical con conduct. Sexual advances, requests for sexual favors. It's not that it never deals with speech, it's that it's not the primary motivation primary focus, and that is relevant under a, a case called Broadway, Rick, which says that you, when you're dealing with something that doesn't deal merely with speech, uh, but deals with conduct as well, there has to be a very substantial part of that uh, uh, speech uh, that is affected by the, uh, by the, by the uh, regulation. My third point, to the extent the rule affects speech, doesn't raise the concerns that Professor Volokh has identified. Now, let me say at the outset that I'm really sort of a First Amendment purist, and I don't distinguish between high-value and low-value speech. And to do that, somebody has to make those categorizations, which to me implicates the First Amendment issues. But that's not what's going on here. Uh, this is not a speech code. Uh, the argument to the contrary, I think, misapplies an important mode of First Amendment analysis. So um, I had a slide, but it's not here anymore. Uh, in the first, uh, 
Imagine a pie chart. The majority of the pie chart is conduct. You have part of it which is speech. Then you say, well, in court speech, and speech in the context of representing a client, well, that's, you know, we can regulate that, narrow that red portion, that's the sliver. Then you say, well, and some of those things, uh, even if they're speech and even if they're outside the context of representation of a client, that's okay because you can't um, call people names, you can't use fighting words, there are certain uh, things you cannot do. And so you have even a smaller sliver of things that are covered by this rule. And the question is whether you're going to invalidate the rest of the valid applications based on that sliver. Now, there is a mode of First Amendment analysis that says, yes, the First Amendment is so important to us that we will depart from the normal rule that you can challenge uh, a regulation that doesn't apply to your conduct uh, in the troublesome parts uh, because it might chill speech. Um, and that's called the overbreadth uh, doctrine. Um, and, and the situations that you, you were presented here about advocating against same-sex marriage, uh, um, the, the examples from harassment uh, litigation, which, by the way, none of them cited were from bar disciplinary proceedings. Um, that, those, that law is referred to but is explicitly not incorporated. Um, but if I engage in those, have I, if I, if I say that uh, Milo Yiannopoulos is a saint, you know, have I, have I committed a disciplinary violation under this rule? No, that would be wrong. That is not a correct interpretation of the rule. Now, I grant you that you cannot defend a rule on the basis that trust us. That's not, uh, you can't defend a rule on the basis of evaluation of the actors. But you can defend the rule on the basis of evaluation of the text, the structure, and the purpose of the rule. And when you do that, you see that these analogies, these hypotheticals, are hypothetical hyperbole. Uh, they're not uh, situations that are likely to arise. Uh, The uh, ethical rules themselves say that their rules of reason have to be interpreted with reference to the purposes of legal representation uh, of the law itself. Um, and then when you look at the text, Rule 8.4 appears in a um, section on maintaining the integrity of the profession. So you have to look at it in the context of that um, a purpose, and then you look at the other acts uh, that are uh, covered, criminal acts, dishonesty, prejudicial, the administration of justice, and so on. You, you, Professor Volokh says you look at this as a major departure. No, you have to interpret this provision in light of those other provisions. And when you do that, you see that these other, that this interpretation uh, to advocate against same-sex marriage, to advocate against Muslim immigration. Uh, it may be uh, wrong, it may be uh, perfidious, but it is not a violation of this rule. Uh, certainly one can discriminate uh, by verbal conduct. You're fired, right? That's, uh, but there's a difference between advocating discrimination and discriminating. Just like the courts have said, there's a difference between advocating um, um, conversion therapy and engaging in conversion therapy. Now, can comments be harassment? Uh, yes, you can, you can call somebody names or racial epithets. Um, let me get this done. Most of you are probably too young to remember this uh, from Saturday Night Live. They used to have a point-counterpoint, and Jane Curtin would, would give an erudite explanation of something, and then uh, 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 
Dan Aykroyd would respond uh, as if he were the other side, side commentator and first words would be, Jane, you ignorant slut. Um, that would be potentially harassing statement. Um, but, um, but advocacy in a public forum lies at the heart of the First Amendment. And so we're not talking about what you're advocating, we're talking about how you advocate it. And under the well-established doctrine of constitutional avoidance, you don't, uh, you, you don't interpret the rule, certainly not in advance, as raising the constitutional problem. Now, that's also, um, uh, um, the, this also says, uh, Rule 8.4, it doesn't preclude legitimate uh, advice or advocacy. And there's no reason to interpret uh, advocacy as, as restricted to the courtroom, particularly not when you're using issues of uh, constitutional avoidance. What's more, there is a mens rea requirement. And when you combine that with the definition of, say, discrimination, which says it has to be harmful, so you have to know that this is, um, that this is harmful and that this is demeaning uh, and do it anyway. It's not whether somebody perceives it. It's whether you know it. If everybody thinks it's okay, then it's okay. Um, now, if there are any, um, uh, so, so the implausibility of uh, these scenarios diminishes the kind, uh, prospect of chilling. Uh, and, and so if the rule is misapplied, and it may well be misapplied in some circumstances, the answer is to challenge it, uh, but not in anticipation. Uh, you know, in most situations in chill, uh, you have, it goes on the judicial gut. It's a prediction. There's no empirical evidence. But here, you have these 24 states. You have uh, states with varying kinds of laws. You have ones that cover employment and ones that are broad and some that are narrow. And so you have the states acting as laboratories. You could get evidence. And we're not talking about litigation here. We're talking about policy judgments. Should you adopt this rule? And so when you're looking at that, if we're going to argue about chill, we ought to have some evidence of it. And I haven't seen that evidence. Maybe Professor Volokh has some. I haven't seen it. Now, there is a, a problem here uh, that this rule deals with. There are, uh, you know, people in depositions and otherwise who have used uh, gender uh, pejorative gender statements and racial epithets and uh, and there are people that have um, there's been cases where a lawyer went back to his office and uh, made sexual advances to four employees you know that um, and when you couple these things with the mens rea requirement and the requirement of harm you, you can raise a legitimate issue about whether this um, uh, relates to uh, fitness of law but Let's talk about whether this should be part of employment law, just very briefly. Part of um, uh, w the legal profession is allowed to regulate itself, and um, it's largely self-governing. That's what the, the uh, comments say. And in return for that, we get, um, we get self-regulation. In return um, for our self-regulation, uh, we get a number of benefits. We get monopoly. We're answerable to the court rather than to the legislature, which is important to the profession because it helps maintain our independence. We get access to compulsory process. Um, but if we want to keep this level of representation, this level of independence, uh, it would be a very good idea to show that we are effectively self-regulating, that we are not inviting the legislator, legislature into our house in order to um, in, in order to uh, regulate us, and that means the, the, we have to do a good job. The sine qua non of self-regulation is public confidence and judicial confidence, which go hand in hand, and in the effectiveness of the system. And the sine qua non of the confidence is representativeness, fairness, legal compliance. Hence, we have a rule against discrimination. 
So the argument that uh, some aspects of lawyer activities are best left in the legislature and the employment laws is, uh, is, is a dangerous argument. Um, as to the danger of abuse in some of the harassment cases, which may, may be wrong, may not, but there's, uh, let me end by saying there are certain reasons why that's unlikely to happen in the disciplinary system. Um, first, the disciplinary rules, unlike the employment laws, are not compensatory. Nobody's going to sue because they're going to get money from you. And second, the standard of proof. They have to, uh, the person doesn't get to prosecute the case themselves, and they have to establish formal charges of misconduct by clear and convincing evidence. So believe me, I'm a defense lawyer. Weaponizing the uh, rules of professional conduct is a grave concern to me. It was a concern when I started on looking at this. But I really don't believe it's going to happen. I don't believe that the problems that uh, Professor Volek has pointed out are going to happen. But if they do, we have a way to deal with them. We can bring lawsuits, we can defend the cases, and we can establish that the First Amendment doesn't permit regulation of certain kinds of statements and conduct. Thank you. Well, being an appellate judge, I'm inclined toward the, the way we handle things in the appellate court. So rather than go into some of these questions I have for the panelists, I'd like to ask Professor Volokh to give us a couple of minutes of rebuttal. Sure. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me, unlike in almost all appellate courts, let me use demonstratives. Uh, just because the text here is quite important. And, it's, and I don't want to dwell on all of the details, but let me just focus on a couple. Um, uh, so uh, one is, let's look at the text. First of all, I think uh, um, opposing counsel, I think, may have misspoken. The mens rea here is not knowledge. It's negligence. Knows or reasonably should know. Uh, but second, specifically covers bar association, business, or social activities. Uh, I've looked, I couldn't find any existing rule that purports to cover social activities. Uh, it may be that there are a few. I'm quite certain there are not 25. I, uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm uh, mistaken. So if we're looking to precedent, oh, this hasn't been abused before, it hasn't been tried before. A lot of the rules are limited to uh, misconduct in connection with the administration of justice, so essentially courtrooms, depositions, and so on and so forth. Uh, None, and maybe if, I'm, if I missed a few, it would, I guess, unless I'm really bad at my research, it would be very few, uh, cover social activities. This expressly covers that. Look at the italics. These are the express situations where this rule deliberately targets speech, targets speech in the context of, among other things, bar association, business, or social activities. It's true it has an exception for legitimate advi advice or advocacy. When you're reading professional rules as to lawyers, the most natural reading of advocacy is advocacy in a courtroom or advocacy in the context of litigation. But even if you say, oh, well, well, that's intended to also cover political advocacy, that would still leave it to the bar to decide what's legitimate advocacy and what's not. Uh, uh, so, so I am not at all, uh, I'm not at all comforted by the, uh, by the assurances uh, that, that, that we heard here. Uh, and uh, uh, part, uh, part of the reason is, is look at the, uh, if you want an example of slippery slopes, not slippery, arguments, slippery slope arguments against restrictions, but in favor of them, this is what we were hearing, right? Well, this is not unprecedented. Similar, not identical, similar things have been done before. We regulate fighting words, we regulate speech in the courtroom. Why not regulate speech in social activities in connection with the practice of law? Uh, well, why not regulate speech that's derogatory or demeaning verbal conduct? I was assured that none of the examples that I gave would qualify. I don't see why. Certainly in the course of speaking out against, say, gender identity uh, and a discrimination law, people can s express derogatory views about people uh, uh, who uh, are about, about transgender people. They could say this is not, a, they, they can, for example, say that that is a mental illness. So, not at all sure that that's right, but if they say that, is that derogatory towards them? Sure it is. 
Uh, is that going to be covered by the rule? Seems to me it would, of course, unless, unless the Bar Association decides it's legitimate advocacy as opposed to the illegitimate. So for all these reasons, I don't find these assurances quite appealing. I read it for what it, for what it seems to me on its face it is. It is a speech code. It is a deliberate attempt to restrict certain quite specific categories of viewpoints expressed in a wide range of contexts, and I don't see any constitutional basis for it. I want to... Uh, Could I respond to that, Jeff? Please. I'll, re I'll respond from here. Um, let's see, uh, Indiana, conduct a lawyer undertakes in the lawyer's professional capacity. Wisconsin, uh, conduct in connection with the lawyer's professional activities. Washington, conduct in connection with the lawyer's professional activities. Ohio, engages in a professional capacity in conduct. Um, New York, uh, covers conduct in the practice of law. Um, New Jersey, in a professional capacity. Minnesota, in connection with a lawyer's professional activities. Uh, you, you know, uh, right now I consider that I'm acting in a professional capacity. Uh, you may disagree, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, that, that those are, um, uh, that, that, that those uh, are, are already uh, are, are already on the books, and we have not uh, seen a problem with them. Um, and do those that you just mentioned do they pertain to harassment and discrimination? Uh, I, I think some of them do. Uh, uh, I don't have all of them excerpted. Uh, uh, I'm sure that some of them do. Uh, Maryland does. Um, uh, oh, Ohio, um, but I can't. I don't have that part of them. Uh, with well, let, let me pose this question to for both of you to respond to, and uh, then we'll try to see if we can have some questions from uh, the audience. This is an area I think uh, perhaps a little less arcane than political finance, and there's probably a good bit of interest in uh, how your future advocacy and work in the legal profession will be impacted by uh, the professional rules. Um, the state of Illinois' rule for professional conduct 8.4 addresses harassment and discrimination, but it does so by uh, tying the finding of professional misconduct to an actual determination by uh, a fact finder. For instance, it, it, uh, it, for example, it reads this way. Um, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to violate a federal, state, or local statute or ordinance that prohibits discrimination based on race, sex, religion, national origin, disability, age, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status by conduct, it excludes the uh, verbal conduct, just conduct, by conduct adversely on, that reflects adversely on the lawyer's fitness as a lawyer, and goes on from there. Uh, why would a, 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 a rule like that not be uh, some protection against uh, an overuse or over or misuse of professional rules? Uh, so, w what I would um, what I would say there is that there's also a rule, for example, against fraud. And would we say that before a lawyer can be um, adjudicated to have uh, or sanctioned for having committed fraud. Uh, there needs to be uh, a fraud determination. Uh, the problem is that these two systems serve different functions. The employment law system is compensatory. It requires somebody who is aggrieved, who wants to sue and get damages, and frankly, suits against a law firm are not easy uh, because there's privilege issues, and there's partnership issues, and, and, and so all of those things are uh, implicated. Doesn't mean that if it's somebody... Not, I, I understand your point on com being compensatory to the person aggrieved, but what about the potential punishment or uh, punitive nature to the practitioner? Not all lawyers are well healed. I can no. testify to from experience. No, I agree, and, and <laughs> I, I, would be, I would be concerned if... Uh, that DC has had this rule uh, 
number of um, jurisdictions have had an employment-related rule for quite some time. Uh, you have not seen a blip, uh, an increase in the number of employment cases. It's not, um, it's not a priority. It, it has to, in order to fit within the structure, it has to be uh, very serious misbehavior. Um, and um, I, I, don't, I don't see that happening. Uh, the burden of proof is significant. Uh, it is not, I think, a significant worry that you're going to have uh, bar counsel who are, um, who are running uh, rampant, uh, running wild and persecuting lawyers. So one thing about the Illinois rule is it makes clear that whatever the rules are the legislature set as to what are the prohibited categories of discrimination, those are the rules by which the law, as to which the lawyer needs to abide. It's an interesting question whether you need this extra level of enforcement. It's an interesting question whether you need to, whether you, there ought to be a finding of liability first. Those are interesting, but the most important point is about half of the state ban sexual orientation discrimination, about half do not. Uh, I think the number is similar, although maybe a little less, as to gender identity discrimination. Virtually none ban socioeconomic status discrimination. I think about half ban marital status discrimination. That is a considered judgment about how to, how to uh, 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 balance the interests of employees uh, against the interests of employers, the interest in employers in freedom of association, the interest of employers in uh, in uh, being free to make various kinds of decisions that they think are sound, socioeconomic status. Uh, about moral and religious judgments of the uh, em uh, employers versus the employees. If the legislature of some state chooses to say, we don't think that it's wrong or wrong enough to discriminate based on sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, socioeconomic status in hiring, I don't see why a court should take a different view. Now, I do think the court, as I said, can rightly, and the state bar can rightly take a different view with regard to, uh, um, uh, with regard to behavior that only lawyers really engage in, or that lawyers have a special edge in engaging in, behavior that affects uh, uh, the, the process of, uh, uh, of litigation, such as the way somebody interacts with a witness. Uh, but it seems to me that there ought to be one anti-discrimination law for all businesses, and not one uh, within a state, and not one for law firms, one for other firms, one for, for other firms. Now, that doesn't touch on the First Amendment issues, which also are not as seriously implicated here, for various reasons, one of which nothing here suggests that uh, social activities or professional bar activities and such are covered either. So I think the Illinois decision, we can, queer, or we can disagree with little details, but I think it reflects a, a much better sort of set, sense of judgment than the bar, uh, than the ABA rule. So if, if I could say the, the ABA rule is a model rule. It is not a statute. It has to be adopted by each of the individual states. If a particular state has a different rule about um, uh, discrimination based or a different sensibility about discrimination based on sexual orientation uh, or marital status, uh, then they can alter the rule accordingly. I think they'd be wrong. Um, but this is a model rule, and so it's not a, an appropriate criticism of the rule to say, well, um, this is state, you're imposing judgment on the states uh, that are inconsistent, that, that is inconsistent uh, with their own values. Yet Illinois actually offered a model that would have avoided any such uncertainty by specifically saying that what lawyers cannot do is violate statutes or ordinances that ban this kind of discrimination. If only the ABA had set forth the same rule, then you could really say it doesn't add anything really new, because then it only, the only question is do you also want to add the level of uh, uh, enforcement from the bar to, uh, to the, the enforcement through the litigation process. But that's not what the ABA for some reason chose to do. But statutes are not the measure of whether a lawyer is fit to practice law or whether the conduct of the lawyer is prejudicial to the administration of justice. So you, the, the, the rule bans dishonesty, it bans fraud, it bans all sorts of things that may or may not uh, be um, uh, proscribed by statute. We stand as gatekeepers to the judicial system. And we have to be, um, we have to act legally we have to act fairly. We have to act with a commitment to equal justice under law, or 
we undermine the, uh, we act prejudicially to the administration of justice because I think the citizenry is not going to respect uh, the judiciary and the system if the gatekeepers are, um, are, are suspect themselves. So your position is that if a lawyer in a state that does not ban sexual orientation discrimination in hiring, discriminates based on sexual orientation in hiring, say, an assistant, that lawyer is unfit to practice law. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. No, no that's, not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, first of all, that state would have to enact a rule. Well, let's so say so the, we're going to follow the model. The IBA sends us the model, we're going to follow the model. And if the lawyer discriminates, um, and it is sufficiently severe, and it is, um, it, it is consistent with the mens rea uh, requirement, and it imposes harm, and the lawyer knows it's going to impose harm. Or has reason to know, that's the number. Or has reason to know, but you know, that's, uh, uh, has reason to know, then, um, uh, th then it, it would be a fair judgment, not necessarily a uh, re requisite judgment under all the circumstances, but it could be a fair judgment that the lawyer has uh, compromised or done something to compromise his or her fitness to practice law. Let's, uh, let's move to questions. Uh, I had some more, but, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to, to hear from uh, Professor McConnell. Uh, a fact, I think this is a factual question or three related. Turn your mic on, I think. Did, did you? I thought. I, I think it's on. Oh, okay. uh, so qu quickly, I'm, are uh, ideological opponents of a lawyer permitted to bring complaints or is there some sort of formal prosecutor with some responsibility at the front? And that's who are the tribunals who decide this within the bar? Are they going to be specialized sort of anti-discrimination tribunals? And the third question is, are there serious uh, professional interim consequences of a bar of an ongoing, of being investigated uh, by the bar for unfitness? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the answer is these are uh, questions of state law, but typically, to good almost all cases, disciplinary proceedings must be brought by a bar counsel who is, um, uh, in many states appointed by the court, by the highest court in the state and other, uh, but is an employee of the bar, sometimes an employee of the court, but that person is a screen and um, they actually are generally um, overtaxed, but um, uh, they, in many states, they, uh, the first stages, that screening stage, most states, the screening stage is confidential um, it is only when the bar council finds probable cause uh, that the uh, proceeding becomes public, uh, and the consequences can vary uh, depending on the sanction that's imposed. The sanction can be uh, can run in some jurisdictions from a private reprimand to a public reprimand. Uh, the public rep reprimand could have uh, professional consequences, um, all the way up to. Um, uh, de, uh, disbarment, which would be unlikely in this kind of circumstance. So, as I understand it, uh, uh, people, anybody can bring a complaint against a lawyer, uh, and they do not have to be the injured party uh, the way that is the case for, say, employment law. And certainly, if somebody hears someone at some bar function uh, saying something that they feel is derogatory based on race, religion, or or whatever else, uh, they feel that it uh, manifests bias or prejudice and is derogatory or demeaning verbal conduct, they can file that complaint themselves, even if they are this person's political enemy or personal enemy. Now, as I understand it, indeed, there has to be, in order for the case to then to eventually be brought before the adjudicator, there has to be some decision by some bar entity. Uh, but uh, the initial complaint can be brought, and can I, my, I suspect, uh, cause considerable uh, problems for the lawyer uh, uh, by, by anybody, including by their political enemies. Uh, my guess is the first of the problems is you'll probably, if this happens to you, you'll probably feel you ought to hire a lawyer. Uh, you could say, nope, I'm going to stand my First Amendment rights and I have confidence in the bar. You could say that. Uh, or, 
Or you might feel that you ought to be hiring someone who can give you advice, who can uh, set forth whatever statements and respond to, on your behalf to whatever inquiries are made. And in the meantime, I'm not an expert on this, but the one thing I've ended up through the Amicus Brief Clinic that I run, uh, that I have had to do a lot of, is pro hack vice admissions. And here's, I believe, the Virginia pro hack vice admissions form, where you have to say that you are not subject to a pending disciplinary investigation or proceeding. And then if you are, you have to explain yourself. Now, again, maybe you can explain yourself. Maybe the Virginia courts will laugh at this proceeding, say, say, we don't care about it because now that you've explained it, it's just fine. My guess is that many lawyers, especially young lawyers, would rather be in a position of not having to explain it. So the ad terrorum effect of even a complaint being brought uh, is, I think, very significant. Can I say one, one little wrinkle on that? Uh, most bar councils have an initial screen on the complaints uh, before they even um, ask the respondent uh, to address the issues. So um, a, a significant number, I mean, you, you can imagine some of the things that bar council gets from uh, pro se people and they're, they're crazy, but uh, uh, there, there are uh, a, a significant number of instances that never even reach the respondent because the bar council has applied a rule 12B standard or something akin to that upon receiving the complaint. Right over here, we had a question. The young lady had her hand up right in. What was it? All right. Um, I'm a lawyer. I'm working in the bar as a practice assistant at Barrow. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on the fact that the So, so the, the rule has been um, in one form or another in, uh, in, in the black letter or the comments of many states. And so the primary thing the ABA did was move the model rule rule from the comment to the, uh, uh, to the black letter. Uh, and um, they... Um, that they did expand, say it, it had to be in connection with the practice of law. We can argue about how broad that is or not. I think uh, I, I wasn't involved with the, um, with the genesis of all this. I did testify toward the end of the process. But some of the things that were cited, uh, there was a survey of 43% of uh, women lawyers surveyed in Florida said they'd been harassed in the course of their career. Uh, the statistics um, regarding women lawyers uh, coming into the profession, um, advancing through the profession in partnerships, in the higher levels of partnerships, in the, in the highest, um, in, the, um, in the ruling bodies of partnerships uh, are, shockingly, are, are shockingly low um, and uh, not entirely explainable by a late start or a changing environment. Um, and so I think uh, there were a number of studies along these lines uh, that prompted the ABA to think that the time had come, uh, and it's been, it's been an issue for 23 years, I think, uh, that, but it prompted the ABA to think that now is time to do something. Next question. The 
advocacy in a public forum is at the heart of the First Amendment. And I think I can't um, uh, give you an off the top of my head definition of legitimate advocacy except to say that the First Amendment uh, strictures would be extremely tight uh, against anyone who tried to restrict advocacy of a position, a contested position, um, a religious position, uh, a political position, uh, ethical position in a public forum. Um, so I think that there would be, um, uh, the, the manner in which you express it may be a different question, but the expression of opinion is protected by the First Amendment. And I would take that case if somebody were, uh, uh, were uh, being prosecuted for uh, that kind of statement. But you see, I had thought that verbal conduct that manifests bias or prejudice towards others or derogatory or demeaning verbal conduct, which is to say speech that expresses bias, prejudice, derogatory, demeaning views, is also generally protected by the First Amendment. There may be some exceptions. Fighting words is one such exception. Uh, they could have been enumerated rather than talk about this verbal conduct with, which, uh, with all of those adjectives. Apparently, the bar seems to think otherwise from me, maybe even from you. And you mentioned public forum. What if it's not a public forum? For starters, I mean, it's not literally a public forum in the legal sense because often it's a private property. Let's say it's a conversation over dinner, social activities in connection with the practice of law. There was just this debate. Uh, th there was just this debate, let's say, at the Bar Association activity. Let's assume that's a public forum about whether there should be more immigration from Muslim countries. And over dinner, people are saying, yeah, you know, we shouldn't have more immigration from Muslim countries because Islam is just a bad religion. It's a religion that's responsible for all this evil. Not my personal view, but this is this person's view. Well, now it's not a public forum. How do you think the bar is going to decide whether that's legitimate advocacy? But more to the point, how can, to what extent can you confidently assure us that if this comes up to the bar, the bar will say, well, this is protected by the First Amendment. This is legitimate advocacy, as opposed to say, well, it manifests bias or prejudice towards Muslims and is derogatory or demeaning verbal conduct. And therefore, we've concluded, based on our view of the First Amendment, that it's not legitimate. It's illegitimate advocacy. How confident are you about that? I'm pretty darn confident. Uh, <laughs> and what's more, uh, there's a mens rea requirement. Uh, that it's not whether the bar or, or somebody else thinks so, it's whether you know or have reason to know uh, that this will, in terms of discrimination, harm someone, uh, or it's demeaning or um, derogatory. And frankly, my own view is that this is focused on individuals and not on uh, abstract statements of uh, policy or, uh, or, or, um, uh, or, or or general statements. Now, a, a general statement could still hurt an individual, but I do not believe that this is. And, and the uh, drafters specifically disclaimed uh, that it was uh, seeking to address the kinds of situations we're uh, Professor Volokh has raised. So one of the comments to the rule originally read, quote, harassment includes sexual harassment and derogatory demeaning of verbal or physical conduct. That's the, conduct, the part that I quoted towards a person who is or is perceived to be a member of one of the groups. So one of the comments originally actually had a limitation that the statement had to be individually targeted towards a person. It still poses interesting First Amendment problems, but that was required. The italicized text was deleted before the comment was adopted. The lights discriminate against the people in the back, so I see somebody <laughs> with, the, with their hand up in the back over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, so. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I just had a question for the partner, Mr. Is it Weiner? Weiner. Weiner. I'm sorry. Um, so it seems to me that you're, you seem to have a, a remarkable level of confidence that this rule is not going to be abused, and that we as young lawyers uh, have nothing to be concerned about. And I, I want to trust you in that. I want to believe in you. I really do. But what would make me more confident in that is you mentioned, you know, taking up cases a while ago. I was wondering if you, on behalf of your firm, would be willing to grant pro bono representation to any person in this room who's brought forward before the bar on trumped up disciplinary charges, because that would really be uh, a way that I could trust in you and this rule. Uh, if you meet our pro bono standards in terms of income and all of that, we probably would. 
I'm but doing criminal prosecution, so I might. If you're a young Rockefeller, we probably would want to charge you. Hopefully that wouldn't be socioeconomic. <laughs> Just back in the back over I'm sorry, here. No. Yes. Hello. Uh, Mr. Weiner, you mentioned several times the important component of mens rea. And I'm just curious, since gender identity is completely subjective, um, how it is a potential discriminator would be required under the new rule to know how the individual is identifying and potentially be subject to discipline for not knowing. Seems like that um, that's an area subject to controversy. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. If the individual didn't, if the lawyer didn't know uh, the gender identity, then it seems to me hard to to um, uh, to argue that the lawyer intended uh, harm. Uh, well, then wouldn't the question become whether they had reason to know? It, and it, the facts may be the dress or the manner of speech or all sorts of weird things that people come up with to categorize. <laughs> Yeah, I think you could spit out lots of permutations, but the, the question is uh, whether this uh, is um, the kind of conduct that is equivalent to the honesty, the dishonesty, the fraud, the prejudicial to the administration of justice, whether it in fact cast doubt on the fitness of the lawyer to practice law. I think you... Um, um, I'm not any, asking anybody to trust me. I'm asking them to read the statute, uh, the, text of the uh, text of the rule, uh, in the context of its history, its purpose, and its structure. So let me just mention again about mens rea, just, just so we're clear how little protection mens rea offers here. The requirement is the lawyer know or reasonably should know that the conduct is harassment or discrimination. Harassment includes derogatory or demeaning verbal or physical conduct. So the only requirement imposed by mens rea is that the lawyer reasonably should know that uh, it is, that the, that the statement he's making is derogatory or demeaning. So for example, if a lawyer says there should be less Muslim immigration because I think Islam is a bad religion and Muslims would be bad, more Muslims would be bad for the country, of course he should know that it is derogatory. It is by intended to be derogatory simply in the sense that it's intended to express the view that a particular religious group, and it doesn't have to be Muslims. In other contexts, it could be Scientologists or it could be, uh, could be um, uh, evangelical Christians or whatever else. Uh, it, the, it's expressing the view that, that's a, that that is a bad group that has bad attributes. The mens rea requirement offers no protection here. Uh, uh, likewise, let's say he says something that is even ambiguous. And somebody says, I find that offensive. And he says, OK, you say you find it offensive. I just, I just don't, don't agree with you. I'm going to keep saying it. Ah, now he reasonably should know that at least some people find it derogatory or demeaning. And then the question is whether the bar will ultimately find that it was reasonable to anticipate uh, that this person's reaction was reasonable. Mens rea. This is the lowest mens rea that, that, that is available in mens rea land, right? This is a negligence mens rea. And how that's going to protect people who want to express views that they may very well agree manifest bias or prejudice. They may very well agree that are derogatory or demeaning, but they think that those are legitimate advocacy, but then the bar will conclude that they're illegitimate. That's the problem. Right back here in the blue shirt. Yes. All right. Can you hear me? All right. So... Here's a little bit of a curveball for you guys. Um, uh, regarding uh, Professor Weiner's rebuttal, there is a comparison I came up with with uh, the American Psychological Association's own ethics code that forbids psychologists from telling patients something is wrong with them because they're gay or taking a public position because they're uh, against uh, LGBT ideas and ideals. And specifically, their rules uh, specifically said areas covered include but are not limited to clinical consulting or counseling, I'm sorry, uh, and school practice of psychology, research, teaching, supervision, trainees, public service, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is, do you believe that national and or state bar associations should follow the example of the APA in regards to um, enforcing rules um, regulating such speech 
in um, in the practice of law, do you think? Uh, I, I think there have been actually a number of cases that have come up pri primarily in the area of conversion therapy that have um, drawn a distinction between what happens in the patient in the patient uh, uh, doctor or the patient psychologist relationship where the rules forbid the use of conversion therapy and what happens outside that relationship uh, not in connection with the um, practice of psychology in terms of advocacy um, and so in that regard uh, I think these rules are parallel. Now, this rule covers aspects uh, of um, the attorney's activities in connection with the practice of law. Uh, th that there's been a lot of reference to social um, uh, social events. They have to be, you know, if I uh, take a client to dinner and grope them, uh, then that is a an issue I think that is fairly. Um, uh, fairly covered by the um, uh, by, by the disciplinary rule. Would it be sufficient? I don't know. Uh, I mean, the point here is uh, you can you can spit out lots of cases. The question is whether this should be this rule should be rejected or challenged um, across the board uh, because in some remote, unlikely minority of cases, uh, it could be misapplied. And my response is that in those cases, it should be litigated or there should be advocacy against it, but that this is not a situation where there is a likelihood or a demonstrated possibility of chill. Professor? I wouldn't read it that way. Because I think No, it's not correct. Not? Because the rule, that, that comment is addressing uh, the hiring of people. No, it's not. It says, including, for example, and if you therefore announce your public reasons for doing this, as being, I think we have to contemplate the oligarchs, it's going to be covered by that rule. It's speech in connection with hiring and firing. Incidentally, uh, lawyers may engage in conduct undertaken to promote diversity and inclusion without violating this rule by, for example, implementing initiatives aimed at recruiting uh, a diverse employees. So what if the part of the initiative is we're going to kind of go to law schools and say, yeah, this is a firm that appreciates uh, what a horrible thing white privilege is and what, how awful whites have been for this country. And that's our way of, advan of uh, uh, implementing an initiative aimed at recruiting and hiring diverse employees. Uh, would that sentence exempt them from possible liability for that? No. Uh, the, the, the sentence suggests that you can have a diversity program and you can implement it. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want in implementing it. It doesn't mean that you could uh, put up a sign that says, um, 
uh, no whiteies allowed. Uh, you know, that would be, is somebody going to report me here? Uh, <laughs> it, All right. It's, I think that the rule has to. Well, it's not my rule to redress. Well, that's actually a comment to begin with, but uh, uh, and the comments do not have force of law. But look, I, I need a gavel. I think uh, I feel more comfortable having that to uh, close our debate. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the Federalist Society for inviting me, and I want to thank our panelists. Please give them a. a Thanks for the participation.